I mean, let's just be real. We all want the faithfulness and the respectability that we perceive comes with a romance like Barack and Michelle's. And despite my complex and ever-changing feelings for hashtag him, I want the glamour and the financial equity and the longevity that comes with a love like j and But the reality is, most black women and femmes have bought into the idea that the road to black love requires struggle and suffering and, and, and a stick beside a mentality, despite what you tell your whole girl. And most black men and masks are still grappling with their ability to be emotionally available to their partner for fear of being emasculated. But what happens to the love lives of black men in masks who've been prohibited from emotional vulnerability and black women and femmes who have been groomed for a life of long suffering and servitude? Hey friends, welcome to my corner of the internet. If this is your first time ever seeing my face, my name is Herbie, Herbie Revolvis. My pronouns are he, she, him, her, hers, and hers is. And yes, that does mean that I wear pants, skirts, pearls, and purses. Child, do we have a show for you today. We're gonna be getting into a lot of different things. You guys are gonna be here for a little while, but first, wine. I'm excited about today's conversation for a number of different reasons, but what, what, pray tell, is today's conversation gonna be about, well, the purview of this video is to analyze the increasingly popularized term hashtag black love and the ways in which the images, the language, and the actualization of this can be harmful to black people in general, but in particular to black women and femmes. Now that's a good pick. I'll be discussing the ways in which white supremacist heteronormative patriarchy has impacted, has impacted the black relational dynamic, taking a more macro approach with regard to discussing gender identification and a more micro or hyper focus on gender expression or more specifically gender socialization, right? Basically, I want to explore how masculinely and femininely socialized individuals are taught to engage with ourselves, one another, and the consequences that breeds in black relationships. And I think we understand that masculinity is not unique to men and that femininity is not specific to women and for that reason I'll be using the terms men and masks and femmes and women interchangeably not because these experiences are the same right we understand that they are different in many ways but with regard to relationships I think and you guys can comment a storm if this video reaches the masses I'm sure you will the differences and there are differences and I want to just say that I know that the differences between you know femmes and women and men and masks right but just for you know, my brain purposes. I'm creating this kind of linguistic buffer because I don't want to be an ass. And I want to respect people and I want to respect, I don't want to erase anybody in this conversation. I also think that it's important that when we create videos about these universal topics like dating and, and navigating love, right? And all of these things, that we include people whose gender expression is not typical. Um, people who are like myself, non-binary and who who oftentimes are erased in the conversations, even when people get specific and very niche with regard to talking about dating and they're talking about specifically black dating and black love, a lot of times people whose experiences, who we would assume experiences are vastly different from ours are actually a lot more aligned with um, the experiences talked about in the video. So what I basically mean is, there are times when I hear black women talk about dating and navigating dating and I'm like, wow, Right, even when I'm with my homegirls, I'm like, our experiences are so similar. They are not the same. But my experience is much more akin to that of my homegirls than that of my homeboys. Right? And that's because of gender socialization and the way that we are indoctrinated in this white supremacist society. So I wanted to inject that in today's conversation. I wanted to inject that nuance for people like me and for people not like me so that we can have a, a more robust conversation. With that being said, it's important to go ahead and set the stage and let you know who you're talking, Cheryl. I am an effeminate gender nonconformant person and I would say that I align primarily with the socialization of women and femmes. Um, but I still navigate life being perceived as a black man that is important. That nuance is important in today's conversation because it requires a specific kind of care on my part when talking about dating and my experiences. Even though this video is not anecdotal, um, it's largely about the systemic structures that make um, black love so toxic. And again, we're going to get into it. <laughs> Stay a while. We're going to get into it. Still, I felt it was judicious on my part to introduce who I am, how I come into this conversation, the way I fit as the narrator of this conversation. I'm not gonna keep chatting. 
it. I'd like to get into it. So let me let you know what you signed up for. In today's discussion, we're going to be starting off by defining what black love is, right? And then describing the different types of black love that I have categorized and the things that I've noticed. And I broke them down into these four distinct groups that kind of intersect in some ways, but are very distinct and can stand alone. And I have concerns about all of them. There's things about some of them that are good, um, some of these groups, and some things that just we need to have more conversations about because they are impacting our babies, they're impacting our adult lives, and it's it, it's trauma, it's ancestral trauma, but I don't wanna get ahead of myself. So like I said, we'll start by defining black love. Then we'll get into the different types of black love that exist in the media and in real life. And then finally, I wanna round this all off by talking about my thoughts about the future of black love. So what is black love? Let's go ahead and start there. Um, I would just I would describe black love as a person, a black person or a person of African descent, embracing romantic fulfillment and romantic interpersonal connection. Before I do my due diligence and I go ahead and tear black love to pieces, even though that's the that's the only kind of love that I want. Let's say that I want a black man, a chocolate man, a, a beautiful chocolate man. And, and for that reason, right? And, when, and I always say, I think James Baldwin said this, they, and he was referring to America. He loves America more than any other country in the world and for that reason he reserves the right to critique her perpetually and I love black love and for that reason I reserve the right to critique her perpetually but let's start off with let's start off on a high note right because it is love we're talking about here everybody just calm down calm down baby we talking about love baby black love is important black love is necessary and it's important for me um, as a person whose identity intersects with the LMNOP community, right? A community that espouses that love is love to stress the importance of black love in particular because while I do believe that love is love, right? Love is that beautiful, unexplainable thing and everybody, everybody, no matter your shape, size, form, race, re religion, or creed deserves to experience the fullness and the profundity of love. That is just too damn good. And whenever you see me take a wine break through any of my videos, cause stay a while, we having a good time. Go ahead and drop a comment, question, concern, or critique at any point in the video. I will be taking multiple wine breaks because I'm a wino, it's what I do. I'm a bit of a lush. Um, so go ahead and drop a comment at any point you see me taking a wine break. But back to the cruciality of expressing the importance of black love. Love in a similar way that queer love is not made available, it's not made accessible, and it's not made possible, right? There is a danger and a harm to expressing displays of queer love in public spaces all across the world, but in particular in a country that's supposed to be the land of the free, and it is the home of the slave, right? Um, we still have to grapple with, this is not possible here for me. Black love in a similar way is under attack because of the oppressive social structures that make it, that impede black love from becoming a reality. Black love is a protest, right? As a result of all of the different systems and as a result of all the different systems and structures that are working against black love, right? That are working against the black family unit. So when, when we espouse hashtag black love, that's a rallying cry, that's a poem, that's magic. The, that is the inception and the personification of in spite of, right? That is, that is to show us what's possible for us. Or at least it should be. Black love is not just the utopia that it posits itself to be down your black Twitter feed, right? It's not all Ryan Destiny and Keith Powers, Barack Obama and Michelle Obama, Issa Rae, and literally some guy, like, what? <laughs> literally some guy, I, I mean, not to go on a tangent, but I literally Googled him, typing, Googled him, and I'm like, who is this man? Where did he come from? What does he do? Right, and the and the only thing that came up was this L article where they just described her husband. And I, I almost feel like I shouldn't say his name because Issa hated him so well. Um, but and the way they described him was a businessman and Issa's husband. That's all we've got. I don't know where he's from, how tall he is, what he does. I mean, Issa. And speaking of hiding them, ah, Kerry Washington. Oh, oh, why you able to hide? Quang 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 quang. Breaking news. I have got some the evidence that I need to show you too. Oh, were you able to hide this fine ass Nigerian man? <laughs> Make it make sense, scary. 
I think that hashtag black love has been co-opted and is responsible for a lot of harmful imagery, demonstrative depictions, and a misinformation campaign targeted at the black community as a whole, but primarily at black women and men. However, black men don't get to escape or evade the harmful depictions of black love, right? And, and the ways that that affects our psyche. Hashtag black love is responsible for uplifting and perpetuating struggle love. Uplifting and perpetuating love stories like Gucci Mane and Keisha K. Orr that glamorize domestic violence and abuse. And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that does bring us to the next chapter of this conversation about the types of Black love represented because it is not a binary discussion. Every, it's not all Barack Obama's versus the, the Gucci Mans and Keisha Gayors, right? It's much more nuanced than that. I mean, Black love is manifold and it's nuanced like any other form of love. However, for the sake of this being a YouTube video and us needing to have categories to better understand my qualms with hashtag Black love, not black love in actuality, but you know, black love as a display and, and this commodified, monetized version of our experience of love, right? So for the purpose of making this video a little bit more digestible, I have broken the types of black love into four different categories, right? So the way I view it is there is the first category, which is the black love reality. Then there is the struggle love model. Thirdly, there is the black power couple. And finally, the one percenters. Like for us to start this discussion with the reality of black love or the black love reality model, because I think that this form of black love is the most pervasive in media and reality, right? Well, actually not necessarily in, me in media, but in real life for sure. Black women are responsible for taking up majority of the financial burden, the domestic labor, and the emotional labor of men, right? With the, with the understanding that in order to have a happy, healthy relationship, you still have to do all of those responsibilities and, you know, protect that man ego, love, and respect him because if you don't respect him, he won't stay. And the socioeconomic stance of a woman has no bearing on this. You can be a wealthy businesswoman at a Fortune 500 company or, you know, just your local CNA making $12 an hour and you would still be in this reality of black love model. I think my issue primarily with this model of black love, the reality of black love, right, is that it requires an increased stress on black women in particular. Right, like to carry the financial, not only are they responsible, black women and femmes, or but in particular, we're talking about black women here, black um, cis women is where the data is, right? And I wanna be true to the data. To carry the financial burden and the domestic work, right? And I think that that is more, that's more of a robust conversation about how feminine people have been socialized to take up the domestic labor role. Domestic labor component is really no respecter of race. Right, that juggling of having, of never being able to clock out is, is a woman's experience in this country and it's disgusting because it should be more reciprocal. But the thing that makes this a uniquely black issue, right, and makes this uh, a uniquely black emotional tax that's placed on black women and femmes is the ways in which black women and femmes have to be, have to on take the emotional labor of black men and masculine people because of the ways in which they are socialized in this country. I mean, let's be real. The white supremacist ideal for a man in this country is to be masculine. And masculinity is inextricably linked with capitalism. I don't wanna to get too deep into this because I do have a video coming up on this channel about men and in particular black men in a capitalist society and what happens, the consequences of being socialized where your capacity um, to be a man, right? Your ability and the permission and the space that we grant you to be a man is contingent upon how much money you can accrue and what you can provide. I definitely want to do a more in-depth video on that, but I wouldn't be doing this video justice if I didn't at least grace the surface. So America requires men to be providers, right? The white supremacist patriarchal ideal requires men to be providers. But what happens when black men exist in a system that strategically removes the access to capital and makes it institutionally difficult to actually gain that access, right? Um, and, and it's for black people as a whole, but specifically black men. It's a really good question to ask what happens to men when they can't fulfill their masculine urge to provide, an urge that they didn't create, an urge that they've been indoctrinated into. But nonetheless, they feel all the more compelled to be masculine because to be masculine is to be a man and to be a man is to be human. You know, in the eyes of men and masculinely socialized individuals. 
Oh my God, is this out there? Mm. Glam! I think what happens is they become dehumanized. Like I just said. Um, if When men feel like they can't be men, they feel elements of dehumanization. Because that's the only identity, that's, that's the identity that they identify with. Right, and so they feel like they're sacrificing parts of who they are. And, and that issue is systemic. That issue is institutional. And the reality is he or they, you know, this man or this masculine person is not going to communicate that to you because that requires a kind of emotional availability and vulnerability that they've already associated with weakness, right? And that they, that in order for them to give you that, they do feel that that comes at the expense of their manhood. I was watching a video by FD Signifier. I hope I'm remembering um, his name correctly. And he is a cishet man, a cishet black man, who did a video entitled Black Men and Love. And I thought that video was interesting because even though you girls probably see a black man, like I said in this video, I am a non-binary individual. And I've all, I, I do feel like I've been socialized in a very feminine way. So a lot of times black men talk and it feels foreign to me, right? I'm like, oh my God, that's the way you guys think? That's, that's how I approach their theology and their ideology. And so when he, he aggregated all these different black men's experiences and their ideas with love, they talked about the kind of emotional entrapment that black men face because they feel like they are limited to only being able to express two emotions without being stripped of their manhood or their masculinity. And those two emotions are anger or lust. And I thought that that was an interesting way to present that because that anecdotal evidence is necessary. I don't see enough of that online. I don't see enough of the vulnerability that it took to even create a video like that coming from a cishet, masculinely socialized black man. Yeah, I needed that. I needed to see that. And I needed to hear that from many different black men expressing themselves in a multitude of different ways. I will have that um, in the description down below along with all of the readings and videos that I did to create a video like this. And while I understand what it looks like to exist in a confine and feel like your identity has been made narrow and there's no way for you to express who you are, you're trapped, right? I still have to acknowledge that when you refuse to engage with your emotions, when you refuse to emote for fear of being emasculated, and I'm not saying that women and femmes make it easy on you because we too are socialized and a cishet masculine patriarchal society that glamorizes the, the, the really strong, healthy black man that has no emotion. But I will say that emotional work and that labor becomes incumbent upon someone, right? And typically it's black women and femmes who have to take up not only their, their trauma, not only have to pick themselves up by their emotional work that they've been carrying all their lives, but now it's incumbent upon us and them to pull their titty out right and, and and to and to coddle you right in spaces and make you feel like a man so not only are you being further masculinized while she's paying the bills and while she's taking care of your kids and while we're doing this emotional work right it's like we're also having to understand what you will not communicate baby the emotions, the emotional maturity and the emotional intelligence is on the ground. Actually, it's beneath the ground, it's in hell. And I'm not, I'm not blaming black men and black, um, and black masculinely socialized individuals because there is no space for that. I'll get into my thoughts about the kind of spaces that can be created for that in relationships later in the video when I talk about my ideas and my thoughts on the future of black love. But I, I just have to, I have it's incumbent upon me to say that when you don't do that work, somebody has to do it for you. And women have to, to, to stand up and be the mother and the father and the provider. And so then now you are so bad, you so you can't be told nothing that when the right man come, you lose him because you're trying to be the, the man. I do disagree with much of what Fantasia just said in that clip. Actually, what she said in the entirety of the clip on The Breakfast Love, uh, on The Breakfast Club sparked a lot of debate across um, online and in particular on Twitter where like literally everything good goes to die. But I think that she brought up an interesting point about the juggling that black women have to do. And I don't think she would have extended it to black femmes or, you know, black non-binary people just because most, you know, cishet people don't extend they don't extend their language or their lexicon just isn't there and it's fine. That's why videos like this exist because 
we want to teach people and to expand people's vernacular and their language and their understanding of who is affected by this increased emotional labor and, and juggling mul multiple tasks. And I'm not denying that it's predominantly black women. I'm just saying that we have to inject other people's existences as well because trans women and femmes and non-binary folk who are effeminate do face some of the brunt, right? So I'm not taking anything away from anyone and I don't wanna do that. But I think a lot of this strain on the relationship is coming from this innate desire, right? This indoctrinated desire to satisfy each other with white supremacist metrics that don't, that don't work for us. They're not available for us. As I said earlier, the social position of women doesn't matter, right? Um, and actually, it actually serves as a disadvantage to black women. I read something um, on The Guardian, and again, all of my resources will be, you know, linked below, um, where a doctor by the name of Derek Hamilton did a, a bunch of research, right? And he's a professor of economics and sociology at Ohio State University, right? And he conducted a study on black marriages um, and black marriage rates and discovered that even high value dark skinned women, right? And high value basically being described as, you know, well educated. Um, a higher socioeconomic status have a lower chance of being married than lower socioeconomic black women. So this means that black women are being penalized in the dating market for the same thing that we glamorize and incentivize black men for doing. You put in more work and you get less on the return on investment. Somebody make that make sense. Somebody look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, hey, Somebody ain't doing the math right. <laughs> Somebody ain't doing the math right. This is why I don't feel bad for the feelings of black men and masculinely socialized individuals when we have conversations, um, truthful conversations about how black women have to often lower their standards in order to partner black men. That said, the bar is in hell. Um, and I'm not suggesting, nor will I ever suggest ladies, femmes, and any trans and cis alike, and even my little gay boys and um, non-binary folk, that you should drop the bar. Never, ever. I actually have different thoughts. I have a different solution on the matter, right? That's but These are my thoughts and this is my solution. But never drop your, I, I don't want to. I'm not looking to. And I would never encourage someone to do that because you do want to seek a love that fits you, that makes you feel good, and that makes you feel whole. The final concept that I wanted to introduce into the reality of black love model, right, is that in these relationships, a lot of the times there is a spiritual power imbalance, right? Um, this, and I think, like, while religiosity is not um, needed in this model it's not always going to be the case right it is very pervasive and it's typically when one or both and, and, and when it's one it's typically the woman is um religious in the relationship and because a lot of the religions most pervasive in the black community focus on the subjugation of women men stand to gain right i think this is in part and in parcel why a lot of black men seek out religious women it's because their fantasies of control are being played out here right ah! they're able to get off um, on being able to control women because it's not me it's God do you want to be a good Christian do you want to be a good Muslim you want to be in good standing with God or Allah and I'll have another video coming where I talk about the misogynistic structures in religion and the way re religion is marketed to women um, and femmes because I think that that is dangerous um, but here I, I had to introduce how when God, when you believe that God requires servitude from you with your man, when you believe that a wife is to serve her husband as she would the Lord thy God and that a husband is merely just to love his wife, the bar is literally in hell, um, that that impacts the way you navigate relationships. And that impacts a lot of the reality of black women. But the concept of seeking women out, women and femmes, for a, having a certain mindset speaks to the next model of black love that I want to get into. The black struggle love model. Girl, I should pour another glass just right now, just because. This type of black love glamorizes what we would typically call hood love. Hood love, right? Um, and, and I'll put some examples on the screen. We know it when we see it, right? It's this like glamorization of the unfaithful, violent, typically mentally, physically, or so, or spiritually, um, and it's typically the man or the masculinely socialized individual. It's this glamorization of abuse. Yeah, that's 
that's what it is. It requires, no, <laughs> it demands a stick beside a mentality. Really what it also demands is the development of a trauma bond. And a trauma bond really is the attachment an abused person feels for their abuser, specifically in a relationship with a cyclical pattern of abuse, right? The bond is created due to the cycle of abuse and positive reinforcement. It's disgusting, it is despicable, um, and it is this thing of, well, of course he loves me. Of course he loves me. Women who, women and femmes who accept this kind of struggle love, um, accept and understand this kind of innate hypersexuality of men. My boys will be boys. Even though that that is rooted in pseudoscience and myths. Any real scientist would tell you that there's nothing innate in a man that makes him more sexual than you. There's nothing innate in a man that makes him more visual than you, whatever that means. Right, kind of struggle love is twofold, right? I think that um, black women believe, black women and femmes believe that this is all we have. Even your black grandma will tell you boys will be boys. And that you should expect a certain kind of behavior from men because they're men, right? They're, they're these, these, these bodies that just react on urge and don't have the capacity for cognitive function and it's completely untrue. All right, I'm gonna hold a grown ass man accountable for his grown ass action. This kind of black love confuses and kind of exchanges love and care for protection and provision. As long as he provides, he care about you, he love you, right? It, 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 it's quite literally the bare minimum. This is, this is the personification of the bar is in hell. His only responsibility is to be present. And most times the struggle of model perpetuates the emotional and physical violence um, that most time is, is lobbed at black women and femmes. Please do believe, please do understand that this kind of hurt and pain transcends the straight community. Since the human rights campaign began tracking um, murders of trans people in 2013, at least 44 trans people and gender nonconforming people have been murdered each year, right? And, and, mo and a vast majority of those deaths were victims of domestic and interpersonal violence. At every turn that we make, society reminds black women, trans and cis alike and femmes that you do not have the right to make decisions. You do not have the right to choose, right? You are you are created to struggle, right? Struggle is a part, struggle and abuse is a part of your love story. It's your mamas, your aunts, your grannies. It's even these women in the media who glamorize domestic violence. Da, 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 you know, calling my mama, throwing shit, breaking shit, fighting, and then like, now you gotta stop me from leaving. But I was never going nowhere. Oh, yep, yeah, you're talking like, about. Pull your gun out and show me, like, bitch, leave. But I wish you would walk out the door. Right. Like, uh, She's from the shine. She's gonna shine. Like, She's from Chicago. You already pull your gun out. <laughs> All the parts of indoctrination and socialization are happening on multiple fronts. Black men are be black men and masculine people are being told that they they reserve the right. They reserve the right to be forgiven no matter what it is that they do. That's what empowered Quavo to get on Beyonce's internet and tell Sweetie after he cheated on her, you weren't the woman I thought you were? Are you kidding me? You can't be serious. Because he is of the belief that no matter what he does, she is supposed to forgive him. That's the way the story is supposed to go. What's wrong with her? And how dare you memorialize your beef with me online? How dare you? Sitting around, sitting up here, kiki keying and laughing and not, not realizing what's right in front of your fucking eyes. AKA, don't question me, you black bitch. Don't question what's going on, ho. I would love to see a black man put up with struggle love in the ways in which they expect and require black women to. I would love to see them, right, have the woman of their dreams have multiple babies outside of the relationship and take them back. I would love to see them be abused and get their ass beat by the woman that they love and come back and expect them to come back. I would love to see them go away for, for years on end, right? And in jail and the mass incarceration thing is much more nuanced in the way that I'm presenting it right now. And we can talk about that on a separate front because it, it is due to in large part, the criminalization and over policing that happens in black communities and the criminalization and demonization of black men's bodies. But I would love to see them put up with someone that they love going away and expecting them to be steadfast. No, 
No, no, they would never. Because black men and masculinely socialized individuals are bred to view black women and femmes as conquests. Our bodies are theirs for the taking. That when you are a person who is a recipient of penetrational sex, I think that men and masculinely socialized individuals view that as a conquest. And so if somebody else does it, they then own you in the same way that they just owned you, if that makes sense. And so they can't get back with someone who has ownership over the thing that they just had ownership over. I don't think it has a lot to do with love and y'all can debate y'all can debate with me in the comments about it. But I think that bottoms, femininely socialized individuals, women, trans women, cis women across the board would agree with me that you view us as conquest and you feel like you have ownership. And in large part, that is what fuels your rage. That is why you can't take back a cheater, um, right, a woman or a femme cheater. You don't make space for it. But I also think that suffering and the acceptance of suffering is ancestral. The requirement of submission in order to really know or feel or understand love is a relic of white supremacy and, a, and directly comes from the playbook of slavery, right? And I think that that in and of itself is a whole other video too, but I think that when we talk about the, the history of suffrage, right, um, that black people have experienced, and the ways that black men have been able to navigate that specifically and how black women um, have not been able to, right? Um, and how black queer people have had to silence, um, right? Their, their identity and their existence. Black cis hetero men will never understand what that looks like. They will never understand what it feels like to have intersecting modes of discrimination. So please, please. Don't don't even think about hopping in the comments and say that oh I th I would expect that I would accept the kind of story. you would never you would never the acceptance of struggle in the ways that you require it from women and femmes is not the kind of struggle that black cis het men have had to go through that's not your history I I, I, could, I could get on my soapbox about struggle love but I don't want to spend too much time on it because this is not a video about struggle love specifically but struggle love is endemic in the ways that we discuss black love across social media and we had to discuss it. I think that may actually be one of the most pervasive forms of black love that we see across social media. And while I think that struggle love is one of the most harmful factions of black love that exists, right, and, and to promote, I think it's also one of the most conspicuous and the most blatantly wrong, right? So it's easy for us to see the light here. Right, I think what's more complicated and difficult to call out, and I think we are reluctant to call out, dare I say, is the black power couple model. I think we feel this innate urge, right, this black urge to protect the power couple model because of fictive kinship, right? Like this false sense of closeness and emotional relativism to these black power couple structures. But I also think that because blackness and power have historically never been able to be in the same sentence, we feel this emotional, you know, fortitude of like, bitch, no, one thing you're not gonna do is talk about Barack and Michelle, which even though, I don't even know if I'll put them in this category, even though they are a fucking power couple, I just don't have the same kind of concerns for that specific couple as I do um, for this specific model. I mean, that's how we get poor black people defending people that they've never met in their relationships on Beyonce's internet. It's me calling Beyonce's internet. But I mean, I think a lot of it is coming from a good place, right? A loving place. And like I said earlier in the video, if you love something, I encourage you to critique it perpetually. I think that while the examples of black love and the black power structure that we, the black power couple structure that we see serves a lot of fucking good, right? Black people need to see ourselves in position of power and also be in love. We need that. I also think that I have concerns about who has access to being a black power couple. I think that, that I want to question the kinds of black women and femmes who have access to that kind of care, who have access to that kind of proximity to wealth or you know wealth just in general. Many of the times I feel like beauty is the qualifier. And when beauty is a stratified hierarchical system, even and especially within the black community, it's largely about colorism, featureism, and all these other markers of pretty privilege that we know so well. And actually, I think this kind of black love often excludes black women and femmes, opting for a lighter, whiter version of this kind of love, building this power couple in a more hypergamous kind of way, right? And, and I also worry on, on the flip side of that, um, the images um, with regard to black power couples is typically men, it's, it's, it's often men and women 
but men in positions of power um, from a capitalist angle, financial power. Is it possible? to be a poor man and a conventionally unattractive or an ugly woman or femme um, and be able to be a power couple? I don't know. I don't know. We do see images of men, um, black men who partner, you know, dark women um, who, are, who are considered power couples. We see that. But the overwhelming imagery of the power couple looks like this. Yeah, he, my feelings and sentiments are not not backed up by research, right? Um, if you guys will remember earlier in the video, I quoted um, Dr. Derek Hamilton, a professor at, of economics and sociology at Ohio State University, and he aggregated a lot of information from a 2003 multi-city study of urban equality to identify why so many dark-skinned women um, who date men remain bachelorettes. And his research concluded that 55% of light-skinned women were married while only 23% of dark-skinned women had jumped the broom. He also identified that dark-skinned women are more likely to marry men of a lower socioeconomic stance than their light-skinned counterparts. And while I do think that broke niggas do deserve a little cookie, right, and broke boys need love too, economics do play an incredibly important role in how a person navigates life and the kind of life that they have access to. And while I think that money can't buy happy, it certainly makes happiness much more accessible, right? It seems that it makes being happy a lot easier. Let me say this. I'm not mad at the light-skinned women and racially ambiguous women and, and white women even who get to cash in on the black love model. I'm really not. I'm happy for ya. But I think that it begets criticism. Absolutely. And I did just mention interracial love in a conversation about black love. Let me ask you right here, right now, drop down in the comments, do you think that black love, right, can be interracial? Do you think that, because I'm, 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 I, you know, I'm figuring it out, I'm working it out, Ooh. I'm working it out. I do think that when black people experience romantic fulfillment, that that is black love, right? Um, but do we need two black people for it to be considered black love? If a black man or a black woman marries outside of their race and they have a long, healthy, monogamous, loving relationship, is that not them experiencing black love? Or is that interracial love? Help me figure it out. I wanna know, drop a comment, it was a line break. Um, but before we even get into the toxicity that I think does come with interracial love and whether or not that even is considered black love, I think it's important for me to say that I'm a supporter of all love, baby. I don't have any room or space to say that anybody, how anybody finds love is wrong. Actually, my conclusions that I'm gonna have at the, have at the end of the video kind of make space. Well, they absolutely make space for interracial love in particular for black women. But I do think that it is important and it would be a disservice if I didn't introduce um, the hypergamy angle, right? And the feelings of resentment associated with choosing white women over black women and then often shaming black women in the process. Because if you're going to choose a woman of another race, please go on and do that. Please go on and mind your business. Please, 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 I have no time for gossip. Go do what you gotta do, baby. But please do not memorialize your displeasure with black women and femmes on your way out. Please. That's the only request that I have. If you want to go do that with Miss Vanilla Bean, do that with Miss Vanilla Bean. If you want to have palm color kids, please, by all means, have palm color beautiful babies. Love that for you. You deserve happiness and a full life. You deserve that. But don't, again, memorialize your displeasure with a group of people who were just minding their business and didn't need you to let them know that the reason why you're searching for people, who, women and femmes who are not black is because women and black women and femmes have always been so mean to you. And you know, we didn't need to hear that. I think it was my uncle who used to say, if I wanted your opinion, I'd beat it out of you. <laughs> if I wanted your opinion, I'd beat it out of you. And that's problematic. You know, I rest my case. And please know, that this happens in the gay community as well. Oh baby, it's running rampant. 
I've seen so many black men willing to accept the femininity of lighter and brighter and whiter gays for exhibiting the same kind of attributes and femininity that black and darker skinned um, gays are, are exhibiting. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the white supremacist urge to masculinize dark skin. That happens so much to black women. They don't even have the opportunity, and I'm talking specifically about femininely socialized black women who opt into being feminine, right? And who want that. It does not serve women for you black men to masculinize their skin. And it doesn't serve us femmes across the board for you to masculinize our skin. It's not fair for you to project your societal understandings of masculinity onto dark-skinned people, right? Um, because we deserve the kind of protection and care that comes with being feminized. Yeah, we do. I think we deserve for our femininity to be legitimized because you will sexualize that Regan for doing the same thing you see me doing. You will sexualize that white boy or that 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 racially ambiguous, lighter skin, loose textured hair, light eyes boy for doing the same thing you see us dark skinned people doing. I always have said that like as a dark skinned person, a dark skinned a dark skinned feminine person, I feel like I have to be pristine. I feel like I have to be perfect in order to be beautiful. Right, and, and I wanna be pretty and I wanna be handsome and I wanna be beautiful and I wanna be sexualized by my partner, romanticize my femininity, God damn it, God damn it! Why am I less deserving of that? It's anti-black. Can I just say that was very anti-black. <laughs> we are not, no colorism here on this. Yeah. And I just have to be honest about it. Now, while I will say that um, I do suffer from ugly duckling syndrome, I do remind myself that the material doesn't lie. I'm a very bad bitch. I'm a very bad bitch. But I feel like if I had an off day, I'd be much more disposable than lighter skinned people. And that's fucking infuriating. And that's not unique to the gay community, but I wanted to introduce that nuance because I feel like there are so many conversations and rightfully there should be discussing the masculinization of dark skinned women because what the fuck even is that? But I wanted to introduce that nuance. Now back to the interracial thing, I think that it can be fucking harmful calling Kimye an example of black love. I don't know, like even though I just spoke about thinking that love is love and I do, I just think that, you know, it's difficult because as I said, black love is a protest. It's a rallying cry. It's an example of what's possible for black boys and girls and non-binary babies everywhere. And, 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 it, and it's, it's directed at white supremacist patriarchy. And so what happens when you partner a white person? It's, uh, while I am able to separate whiteness from white people, which I've had this conversation with my friends, that I do not believe that whiteness is redeemable, but I do believe that white people are redeemable. In the same way that a vast majority of the heterosexual men that I have met have all been homophobic. But do I think that heterosexuality is disposable? No. Absolutely not. I'm rooting for you bitches. I'm rooting for you girls. It is not my issue with them. It's heterosexism that's my issue. It is racism that is my issue. It is the, the construction of whiteness and the superiority complex that comes with that that is my issue. But I will say that it's a muddy, it's a muddy, muddy structure when we start talking about intersexual, uh, excuse me, interracial love in the conversation of black love. It just gets muddy. Now finally, we will be talking about what I like to call the one percenters. And I know that that connotation connotates that um, there is a very small minority of black people who are doing black love right. Um, and I think that that's because that's true. Fight with me in the comments, we'll talk about it. But I think that the fullest kind of black love, and it is depicted in the media, should be messy, but respectful. It should be where roles in the relationship are assigned, not based on gender, but based on qualification and what a person brings to a relationship. I think that there should be room for your man or masculinely socialized individual to cry or your woman or femme to be able to decide or make decisions for the future of you all's family unit or relational unit without fear of being masculinized or socialized in ways that they do not want to be. 
I think that we see that in examples, and this is why I wanted to reserve um, Barack and Michelle from the power couple, even though they are a power couple, love them bad. But I wanted to put them in the one percenters because they are an example of what hard work does. And Michelle Obama being a dark-skinned woman who works hard, even though the stats bear that dark-skinned women who have access to more education and, and, and economically and are economically sound are less likely to be married, she still has partnered a black man who creates space for her to be strong, vulnerable, docile, beautiful, feminine, you know, assertive. He makes space for her to be a star, for her to be her own voice. And, and she makes space to stand behind him, stand beside him, stand in front of him, right? Um, and, it, and it's this kind of full, robust view of black love that fully has extradited the relics and the vestiges of white supremacist patriarchy and slavery, right? that makes space for human beings, black human beings, to share space with one another and be our fullest selves. It exists everywhere. It exists all around us. But I think that it's about consistently doing the work of perpetually unlearning white supremacist patriarchy. And that's why I call it the 1%. Because we are indoctrinated into this. This is a hegemonic control process where we actively participate and being controlled by it because we feel this is just how I feel. This is just what works for me, right? And, 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 th and that brings me to what I think about the future of black love. <laughs> the future of black love. The future of black love is much more brown than anything else. Is black women embracing, um, you know, dating outside of their race? We can't fully understand what the future of black love will look like until black men and masculinely socialized individuals start to engage with the literature on the intersexual feminism, right? Um, because that serves us all. Intersectional feminism gives you a space to express the fullness of your masculinity and your femininity because you're a robust human, black man and masculine socialized people, okay? It, it, it helps you understand the white supremacist structures that make you think about women and men and, and, mas and femmes in the ways that you do, right? It helps you understand the pain and, and, and the rigor and the, the aggression with which we approach these topics because a bitch is tired. Oh, she's tired. It's always like when black women, you know, get up and they say black men are not protecting us. That's what black women will say. Black men will then turn around and be like, well, then if, I, if we're not protecting, what it look like to protect you? What are we supposed to do? Because black men are, are going through do, 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 do. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You had me and then you lost me. A lot of black men are not protecting black women because you don't have to engage with the literature that will teach you how to protect black women in the ways that they need to be protected. You don't have to, be it not for your blackness. You would be navigating life in the same way as your non-black male counterparts of, of a similar socioeconomic stance, right? You don't have to engage with, intersect with intersecting modes of discrimination. And for that reason, you don't engage with the literature that would empower you to best understand how to protect black women, queer people, femmes, trans women, non-binary people. You would learn this, it's in the literature. People don't want to keep doing the work of teaching you things that people have already taught you. The information is available. It's ready and it's waiting for you. If you're willing to do that work. I think you're not willing to. I think you're not right. I think the future of black love should be more honest. It should be more accepting. And it should be a protest to white supremacist patriarchy and all the gender roles and ideals that come with that. Now with that being said, this is my longest video ever. I've never made a video this long. Thank you guys so much for staying. Oh, it's time. Hey, what's up? What time is it? Ooh, it's been a minute. And if you like this video, be sure to come back next Sunday where we'll be discussing something similar or not. Because on this channel, we discuss pop culture as it intersects with critical thought, navigating life in your 20s, and a bunch of other random bullshit. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you can become a subscriber. Biggity bell, also the notification bell, and drop a comment, comment, and drop a comment, question, concern, or critique in the comment section down below. We will be continuing this conversation as we do every Thursday on my IG live show. Let's wake it up! And I'm thinking about moving to Twitter spaces because the girls be getting into some things over on Twitter spaces. Anything that crossed your mind while we were talking, if you have an idea about what to call the people who watch this video, support these videos, and support this channel, make sure that you comment down that down below. And while you're here, catch one of the videos that I dropped last week. And before I go, you know I gotta tell you guys this. Please do not just live your truth.
that's selfish. Live the truth. There's a difference.